There are moments in geopolitics that don't come with loud announcements, missiles on parade, or dramatic sanctions. Some moments arrive quietly, hidden inside a university policy, buried in an academic notice, disguised as administrative housekeeping. But every once in a while, one of these small bureaucratic adjustments turns out to be a tectonic shift. This story begins with a single student at Harbin Institute of Technology, one of China's most strategically important universities. He did something unusual. He earned a PhD without writing a dissertation. Instead of a thesis, he graduated with a piece of advanced engineering, a vacuum laser welding process, complete with equipment, documentation, and industrial application proof. It wasn't a research paper, it was a tool. A tool designed to solve a real bottleneck in advanced manufacturing, one of the pressure points created by U.S. export controls. This wasn't a loophole, it was a landmark, and it was the first visible sign of something much bigger. China is rewiring what a PhD means, not just refining it, not just modernizing it, but weaponizing it. Because when the world's largest STEM producer decides that the PhD is no longer primarily an academic credential, but a piece of the national security apparatus, the consequences ripple far beyond campus walls. This isn't about education reform. This is about a strategic recalibration in the middle of a tech war, where the battlefield is global, the weapons are semiconductors and materials, and the decisive resource is talent. To understand the significance, we need to take apart the old model and see why China is abandoning it so abruptly. For decades, China's academic system has been powered by what critics call SCI worship. Students and professors were rewarded for publishing papers in prestigious international journals. Careers depended on citation counts. Promotion committees scanned bibliographies rather than factories. PhD graduation requirements at top schools even mandated publications in specific index journals. The system produced volume, sometimes at spectacular scale. It also produced the darker incentives, paper mills, duplicate studies, and an entire gray economy built around academic output. But even when the research was legitimate, it didn't always matter. A brilliant paper on advanced turbine materials doesn't help if the materials themselves can't be produced at scale. A breakthrough in laser physics is irrelevant if the equipment is imported through supply chains vulnerable to sanctions. The gap between academic knowledge and industrial capability became painfully clear once the United States began tightening controls on lithography, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, aerospace components, and precision tools. China could generate theory. Implementation was the bottleneck. That is the key phrase here, the bottleneck. In Chinese policy documents, it appears as kabwazi, literally the choking point and the country has a long list of them. High-end lithography, precision sensors, advanced materials, industrial software, and many pieces of machinery needed in aerospace and defense production. These bottlenecks turned into policy urgency, and that urgency became the catalyst for China's most important shift in higher education in decades, turning PhDs from paper producers into problem solvers. The new model is simple in concept, but radical in execution. A PhD can now graduate by building something, not a prototype for show, but a real deployable piece of technology that directly addresses a national bottleneck. The dissertation becomes documentation. Peer review becomes practical validation. Expert committees broaden to include engineers from state labs in defense industries. The threshold for graduation becomes performance, not prose. It's not reform, it's rearmament. Harbin Institute of Technology is the perfect institution to pilot this shift. It belongs to the Seven Sons of National Defense, a cluster of universities deeply integrated with China's military-industrial complex.
These universities feed the defense sector with engineers, researchers, and entire R&D teams. Their faculty work on classified projects. Their labs conduct dual-use research. When a pilot like this begins here, it carries a signal. This is not about academia. This is about preparation. That preparation begins with rethinking what a PhD is supposed to accomplish. In most academic traditions, American, European, Asian, the doctorate is meant to show mastery of theory, methods, and the ability to conduct original research. That model produces excellent scientists. It produces respected scholars. But it doesn't necessarily produce the kind of engineers who can break foreign monopolies, replace imported components, or rapidly iterate industrial processes under external pressure. China's leadership has concluded that the old model is too slow, too theoretical, and too vulnerable in a geopolitical environment where access to critical technologies can be cut off overnight. So the country is going in a new direction. Instead of asking, what new knowledge did you create? It now asks, what strategic capability did you add? And that shift has profound implications for the balance of power in the global tech race. To see why, imagine education as an assembly line. In the United States, the line produces researchers. Many of them go into academia. Some go into industry. A smaller group enters government labs. The connections between universities, companies, and defense agencies are real, but often fragmented, with cultural and bureaucratic boundaries in between. China's new model collapses those boundaries. The PhD becomes the assembly line. Students don't write papers that industry may or may not use. They create solutions that industry explicitly needs, evaluated by the people who will deploy them. Factories and state labs are built into the graduation process. Universities act as part of the supply chain. The pipeline is unified, directed, and increasingly militarized. This matters because engineering speed is now a geopolitical asset. The country that can iterate faster wins. The country that can translate theory into production faster wins. The country with more engineers who think in terms of solution deployment rather than publication credit wins. China is aiming to become that country. Consider the scale. China graduates more STEM students each year than the United States, Europe, and Japan combined. That numerical advantage was impressive, but not decisive, when the system rewarded publishing papers. Now, imagine redirecting even a fraction of those students toward bottleneck technologies, semiconductor tools, advanced materials, aerospace components, industrial software, automated manufacturing processes. Imagine them graduating by building actual tech that feeds into actual supply chains. The scale advantage becomes strategic leverage. But scale is only one part of the equation. The second is alignment. The United States has the most innovative universities in the world. It also has the least coordinated ones. Washington cannot tell MIT, Stanford, Georgia Tech, and Caltech to overhaul their PhD models next year. It cannot require universities to produce specific technologies. It cannot order PhD committees to include Lockheed Martin engineers. And even when collaboration exists, it often involves firewalls, legal reviews, and administrative distance. China operates differently. Educational reform is coordinated vertically through ministries, implemented horizontally through universities, and tied to industrial strategy. When the Ministry of Education issues a guideline on practice-oriented doctoral training, defense universities don't debate it. They implement it. This centralization is often criticized in normal times. It's slow, rigid, and susceptible to groupthink. But in a tech war, where the goal is not creative chaos, but rapid mobilization, it becomes a competitive strength. China can deploy the same reform across dozens of universities simultaneously. It can scale up a talent production model with the same efficiency it uses to scale factories. The third advantage is speed. PhD students are China's fastest innovation cycle. They are not constrained by corporate bureaucracy. 
they don't need to seek approval from multiple layers of management. They are young, ambitious, and often desperate to stand out. When the reward for graduation is tied directly to solving an engineering problem, the system harnesses all of that urgency towards strategic goals. A dissertation can take years to produce. A product requires iteration. Iteration creates learning curves, and learning curves lead to capability. When this capability accumulates across thousands of students, the national innovation system accelerates. Compare this with China's state-owned enterprises, which dominate key tech sectors. Many of them struggle with inertia, siloed management, and slow adoption cycles. Students have none of those constraints. They are the ideal shock troops for engineering. This is why China is quietly shifting the burden of innovation from SOEs to universities. PhDs are cheaper, faster, and more willing to take risks. They can be pointed precisely at bottlenecks where foreign suppliers are unavailable or unfriendly. They work at the intersection of theory and practice, and once they solve a problem, they graduate into the same companies that need their technology. It's innovation through youth, scaled by policy. The effects ripple outward. China's tech ecosystem becomes more self-reliant. Domestic supply chains strengthen. Foreign restrictions lose potency. And over time, China begins to erode the strategic advantage held by countries that currently dominate advanced manufacturing, semiconductor equipment, specialty materials, and industrial control software. This is the real purpose of the reform, reducing vulnerability. In a world where technology is increasingly weaponized, China is trying to ensure that no external actor can choke its industrial base with a single export ban. The policy signals are clear. Talent will be mobilized to shield the national economy from geopolitical pressure. This raises an important question. If China is turning PhDs into engineering soldiers, what does that mean for research, curiosity, and long-term scientific discovery? This is where the picture becomes more complex. There is an inherent trade-off between solution-driven engineering and curiosity-driven science. The former produces results quickly. The latter produces breakthroughs slowly. The former helps a nation survive sanctions. The latter helps a nation lead in the frontier sciences that shape the next century. China is making a deliberate choice. In the near term, survival and self-sufficiency come first. The country already invests heavily in basic research, but it wants to close the gaps that make it vulnerable in the present. It wants to control the machinery of modern industry. It wants to master the materials that fuel its aerospace programs. It wants to build domestic alternatives to foreign technology. Curiosity can wait. Capability cannot. This doesn't mean China will abandon basic science. But it does mean that engineering, not theory, will drive the next decade of Chinese innovation. And that has consequences for the broader world. Other countries are watching closely. Nations that worry about supply chain resilience, semiconductor independence, or strategic dependency are beginning to consider similar models. There are whispers in Japan about tighter industry-university integration. India is examining ways to accelerate semiconductor talent training. South Korea is rethinking its own engineering programs. Even European policymakers, long resistant to anything that sounds like industry-driven academia, are starting to acknowledge that the world is shifting toward applied innovation as a security imperative. China is influencing global education without saying a word. This brings us to the deeper strategic insight. The great power rivalry of the 20th century revolved around nuclear weapons, missile ranges, and submarine fleets. The rivalry of the 21st century revolves around something far more fundamental. Who can build the materials, machines, and chips that power everything from smartphones to missile guidance systems? Weapons matter, but the capacity to build them matters more. And building them requires three pillars. Three pillars that now form the core of the modern strategic triad. First, chips the brain of every modern system, civilian or military. The United States still holds the advantage here through technology choke points, lithography, EDA software, precision tools, and manufacturing IP. Second, materials. 
high-performance alloys, advanced composites, thermal coatings, ceramics, and rare earth processing. China has strengths here, but lacks independence in the most advanced categories that matter for aerospace and cutting-edge manufacturing. Third, engineers. Not just any engineers, but engineers trained to think in terms of deployment, scale, and national capability. Engineers who solve bottlenecks. Engineers who replace imported components. Engineers who design under pressure and iterate under constraints. Chips provide intelligence. Materials provide structure. Engineers provide capability. China understands that the third pillar can compensate for deficiencies in the first two. You cannot buy chips under sanctions, but you can build the machines that will someday make those chips. You cannot import certain materials, but you can develop new processes that bypass foreign patents. You cannot access certain technologies, but you can train engineers to replicate, replace, or reinvent them. This is why talent becomes the decisive resource. Unlike oil, engineers are renewable. Unlike minerals, they can be scaled. Unlike foreign partnerships, they cannot be sanctioned. Talent is the only weapon system that grows. This is where the story returns to where it began, the quiet graduation at Harbin Institute of Technology. It may look like a small thing, a student swapping a dissertation for a welding machine, but it symbolizes a profound shift in how China thinks about power, security, and development. It shows what happens when a nation decides that knowledge must serve strategy. It marks the turning point where universities stop preparing students for academia and start preparing them for a technological siege. This is not the first time China's universities have been mobilized for national goals, but it may be the most ambitious attempt to integrate talent into the national security ecosystem. And unlike previous campaigns, this one aligns with global trends, the militarization of supply chains, the weaponization of technology, and the return of long-term geopolitical competition. The world is entering an era where the battlefield is not a remote island or a disputed sea. It is the classroom, it is the laboratory, it is the workshop. It is the place where a student decides whether to write a paper or build a machine. And in this new era, the balance of power will not only be measured by missiles, aircraft, or ships. It will be measured by something quieter, the number of young engineers who can turn a national bottleneck into a national capability. China is betting that this number will define the future. And whether the rest of the world likes it or not, that bet is already reshaping the global landscape of innovation, competition, and security.